Hello and welcome. I'm Andreas Fertig. I work as a trainer and consultant primarily for C++. And I'm also the creator of C++ Insights. And this is also the tool I like to talk about in this series. So in today's episode, I'm going to talk about C++ Lambdas. We see here already an example, a very short one of a lambda. So in line number seven, I create a lambda which is directly executed. It captures everything it uses by reference and mainly it uses the variable i I declared uh, at line five there. And if I transform this in C++ insights, um, I assume that most of you already have heard that. A lambda in C++ essentially is a class. So it's a lot of syntactic sugar the compiler does for us, transforming the statement on the left to the one on the right. And as you can see in line number seven to 23, this is the lambda the compiler creates for us, or more precisely, the class. Now, um, let's cover the basics first. So what is a lambda here? What's this? specific part, um, why is it working? So in line number 10, we have the call operator on the right side. There we can see that the body we provided for our lambda on the left in line number seven is directly transferred to line number 12 on the right. And because it's C++ in science, we also see all kinds of operator stuff when it comes to IO streams, but that's not, um, part of the topic today. So we see further down in line number 16 that the compiler created because we asked for it a capture of the variable i. So the class lambda 73 comes with an int reference named i, which is what we ask the compiler to capture on the left. So this is something the compiler does for us. And this is important, this variable is private. And then below in line number 19 to 21, we have a constructor which is public, which um, takes an int ref on the line i and it initializes the member variable of this class. And then because we didn't request the lambda that we have a name because we directly execute it on the left, the compiler creates directly an instance of that variable or of that class for us and initializes it with i. And then below in line number 25, the call operator is invoked and with that lambda is executed. So that's very quickly, very rough um, how a lambda works in C++ insights and how they are modeled internally. Now there are a few things when it comes to showing what they are doing and in C++ insights especially. So one discussion often is, is it a class or is it a struct? So a C++ insights is Clang based. What Clang in this case, in fact, tells me is that it's a class. The next thing is, yes, the member field in line number 16 that's private, as Clang tells me that it's private. The name of the lambda, on the other hand, in line number seven, um, that's made up by me. So because the compiler creates this type, it doesn't need a name to refer to it. It has other mechanisms to refer to elements in the AST. It doesn't need a name anymore at this point. But to visualize it, especially if there are more than one lambdas in use, I needed a system and the system I'm currently using is, and the system I'm using is that I'm using the line number and the column in which this lambda appears. That works in almost all cases, except for veridic templates when we use a lambda there, but um, that's for another episode. So this is the name. The name is obviously fake. The compiler doesn't need one. Um, Sad but true, um, if it comes to what C++ Insights has to add 
to the Clang AST because usually I stay very close to it. But lambdas are a very special case. So then the next thing which causes discussions is the part in line number 19 to 21 on the right. This is the constructor. I am remembering having a discussion with Jason Turner. I think it was Codive 2019, but maybe another conference in 2019 is possible as well. Whether it's correct showing this. Um, and the reason is that in fact the standard says that all the captures are direct initialized. And what you see here is no direct initialization. It's the usual initialization wire constructor. A direct initialization would maybe more something like this, and I'm switching to Compile Explorer now. So if I paste that stuff in here, then in theory, we can create direct init by making it a struct and the member non-private, so public. That now would be a direct initialization of my captured variable i inside the lambda. Thing is, the standard also mandates, switching back to C++ insights, that the captured variables are private. So I cannot use that approach. And remember that I told you that Clang also tells me that in fact it is a class. So Lambda is modeled in Clang as a class and it has a private capture field in my case I. However, the constructor I make up to get the thing to compile. Because otherwise there is no way for me or us around this. I cannot direct initialize a private member of a class. Um, that would be insane. It's the sole purpose of having a private member that no one outside the class can access or initialize it. And this is one of the cases where the compiler can do better than we can do. Because what you are essentially seeing on the right, this is what we can create. This is why this code compiles. But as I said, there is no direct init happening here. And for a simple variable like I it may not matter that much because I take it by reference here. So it's slight indirection. But if it comes to variables that need to be moved or something like this, then it makes a big difference because I have to move them now in the constructor and from the constructor into the variable. And for each part of such an object that is not movable, we get the copy. So we get an additional copy. And that's where lambdas in C++ generated by the compiler are more efficient because the compiler has the power to direct initialize I in line number 16 because it created a struct and it already knows what it's doing. So this is allowed for the compiler, but not for us. And this is one of the parts where it gets hard and it saddens me that um, I have to tamper here with the source code and add things that are not really there. Um, but they are there in C++ insights to visualize it, to make it compile and to make the picture a bit more complete because otherwise it would be probably more confusing. The way it's displayed now with the reference or const reference in case is, as I said, very close to the efficiency the compiler gives us, but the compiler can be more efficient if it comes to movable things, which contain non-movable parts. This time, let's peek a little bit into the implementation of C++ insights, because when I'm telling you that I am tampering with the output or I'm trying to stay close, it may help you to see where all that things come from. So we are here in, in codegenerator.cpp and here specifically in the method insert arc, they're all called insert arc here because it's an overload. And we are looking for the one that takes a record decal pointer. 
Um, this is the method that creates or recreates classes or structs for us. So if you scroll down a little um, to this line here, there we can see that I invoke a method called get tag decal type, which is also from C++ insights. But that method essentially checks whether it is a struct or a class or a union that we get from the compiler, from the AST. So this is why I'm saying to you that I'm not lying here. Um, Clang tells me that it's a class. Now let's get back to our method. So for the most things we are seeing here, this is either generic or for classes in general. And here is the loop that goes over all the declarations in a class. So this is um, the same for method declarations as well as for member declarations like variables. And what we can see here is the part which checks for the access level and inserts the new level whenever it changes opposed to the former one, which is stored in last access. So it's also true that my member variable i is in this case in the private area. Now here down in line 2682, there is a part that specifically deals with lambdas because there's a lot of specialties to do. The captures are something like this. I have to introduce the constructor I told you. So every time we have a lambda that either has captures or is default constructible and assignable, we need a constructor or yeah, we need it to get the code to compile. And this is what we have here. So the code here checks whether my last access level is public or not and whether we need a constructor or not. I put the constructor here in a comment because it's not really there. And I like to introduce only the things that are really needed, but I like to show the other stuff as well. And then below here, we have the method to add to inits. And that's a lambda. It's funny because we are talking about lambdas and this code is supposed to generate a code for a lambda. So why not use a lambda to do it? And this lambda here, it deals with creating the capture list and all the stuff around. So it does multiple things in one step. It creates the fields and the names of the fields. And it also ensures that we have the proper initializer list after that. So here's the CTOR initializer list in line 2717. There are special cases when it comes to capturing the this pointer and they are handled here. But as you can see that that's all special code. So I need to do much more things to recreate a lambda than I need to do for most other statements in, in C++. So here's once again, check whether this is a disk capture, then do it a little bit differently. And otherwise, um, this is a special part here. I have to figure out from the capture list, the original member and its type or the original variable and its type um, to recreate that as well, because um, we are in the internals of the compiler here because the lambda is created by the compiler. Information is stored a little bit differently or with less information than it is required to recreate it. So that's why I have to do an awful lot of additional stuff here. So we are still looking at generating a lambda. In fact, it, it ends down here. A fair amount of code, just recreating a constructor and some captures. This is here what we are looking at is uh, the part where the constructor is created. It's also taking care to say whether it's default constructible or whether it's defaulted or not because it's default constructible and all that things. So this is just to give you a peek into how the implementation looks behind the scenes. It's, it's much bigger. As you can see, it's a tremendously large file because it handles all the things currently working mostly. Um, there are just a few helper files around. So I hope all of this helps you a little bit to understand how lambdas are modeled in C++ and 
why the output of C++ insights differs at this point a little bit from the original implementation or from the efficiency the compiler can give us or gives us, in fact. That's it for today. Stay tuned for the next episode. Bye-bye.